Hello, hello, welcome back. Uh, this is our third day to read from Guns for General Washington online. Um, I really want to thank the publishers and the authors of these books who are allowing us to read these online because it makes such a difference for our virtual classroom that we can actually have your teacher reading to you and marking up the books with you. So for that, I really just want to give a big shout out to them. Uh, this one is a Harcourt Embrace that is allowing us to do this. So that's, we're thankful for you. So we appreciate it. All right, so without further ado, we are going to be reading chapters 17 and 18 today. So when we left off, we left off with our groups still, our, our caravan moving south. And we also had the incident where JP, the young boy, is now leading his own team because his father's injured. And as he was leading that team and they went by the, the bloody pond area, he thought he saw all these ghosts and haints and all these different things. And it turned out that it was just a soldier sleeping in the road uh, who had a little bit too much to drink and needed to get back to his, his place. So without further ado, let's jump into chapter 17, shall we? So the, the title of this is South to Claverack. Uh, so this is going to let me know if I make a prediction about this chapter that they are going to be a little bit successful in their endeavors of going south. So here we go. Will and his brother stood on the bank, stared at the river, which was chocked with ice flows. So that means they're standing on the edge of the river, on the dry land, and they're looking into the water. And inside the water, there's tons of chunks of big, big, big chunks of ice. Now, this is really hard for us to understand because we live in Miami. We're not used to having large chunks of ice anywhere. But where it's cold and the rivers freeze over, as it defrost or as it gets warmer, the river actually causes big chunks just to kind of flow down. It's kind of cool looking. Uh, you might want to look it up. So if you look up on Google, if you type in ice flows, uh, river ice flows. You'll be able to see what that would look like so you could help you visualize. So William began to sing an old folk song. The river is wide, I cannot cross, and neither have wings, I wings to fly. Build me a boat that can carry two, and we shall row, my love and I. So if you're singing this upbeat song, I can infer that things are going relatively well right now. The colonel grunted and waved his hand. We'll need more of a boat to get across this mess. We'll need a whole fleet. Sometimes I think the weather gods have turned royalist on us. So maybe things aren't going as well as I thought. So if he says, I think the weather gods are royalist, what he's saying is that he feels the weather gods are British and not patriot in nature. Uh, so this is definitely conflict of man versus nature right here. South of Albany, the convoy was at a halt again. Now guys, I'm gonna show you my page so that you can actually pause and mark this up if you want right now, or you can go to the website and you can look at my page markups there. But if you'll notice, I have some conflict going on and we've got a little bit of setting and different aspects that I wanted you to mark, some alliteration. Okay. According to the plan, they were supposed to go back across the Hudson at this point. On the other side, they would pick up Old Post Road a smooth route that would quickly take them to the town of Kinderhook. But as their bad luck was continuing, a sudden thaw had set in and the river ice had started to break up. Now, it was a mass of huge flows moving sluggishly downstream. There was no solid place where the teamsters, that's the animals and things, could cross. There were no barges nearby not that they could have been much use on an ice-clogged river. So that whole paragraph right there is definitely conflict of man versus nature. Henry shook his head. The ice flows seemed to taunt him. For the first time since Lake George, he felt doubts of the plan, but he forced himself to sound confident. We don't, if we don't have to cross here, we'll have to go, if we don't cross here, he said, we'll have to go miles out of the way and we've lost too much time already because remember guys time is super important at this point because General Howe is about to get a lot of reinforcements and they need these cannons before General Howe gets those reinforcements 
and we've lost too much time already. We will stay put and pray for another freeze. Muttering to himself, he stomped over to the farmhouse serving as his headquarters. At the kitchen table, he sat down and wrote another letter to Lucy, whom he deeply missed. Guys, do you remember who Lucy is? Well, if you don't, let's think about this. If he's writing a letter to a girl who he deeply misses, he has to have some sort of a relationship with her. Is it a girlfriend or a wife? If he answered wife, he got it right. Well done. Uh, then he sent a report to General Washington. So what can we infer if he wrote to his wife first? He really does love her quite a bit. Uh, then he sent a report to General Washington, which would go to Cambridge by courier. In it, he wrote, now what you're gonna see right here, this is a primary source document. It's in italics for a reason. Um, the want of snow detained us for some days, and now a cruel thaw hinders us from crossing the Hudson River. The first severe night will make the ice sufficiently strong. Till that happens, the cannons and mortars must remain where they are, which pains me exceedingly. Mm. Uh, after 48 hours of impatient waiting, which kept JP and everyone else on edge, the freeze finally came. The next morning, the river was so solid and the, was solid and the vehicles made their way slowly across the ice, going around the craggy flows that jutted up here and there. Once on the old post road, the men moved at a long at a steady pace. They reached Kinderhook without mishap, though some of the horses were trail weary and had to be replaced. After resting here for a while, a train, the train, that means the, the convoy. It's not like a choo-choo train, but it's a train of people, or a train of animals, a train of weaponry. The train forded or crossed the shallow branch of the Musique River and headed south to Claverack. For a while, the travelers had better luck. So that's foreshadowing that something bad is going to happen in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, for a while, the travelers had better luck. They reached town by nightfall, and again, the whole community came out to greet them. So let me show you my pages. And you can go ahead and pause and then mark up, or again, go online. Here's this one. Okay. Colonel Knox was cheered, pleased with their progress. It had been their best day yet. He was looking forward to an early morning start. Suddenly, there was a loud cracking noise. A sled hauling the 18 pounder had been weakened by the journey. It collapsed in a shower of splinters and broken wood. Just when things were looking up, right? Will and Henry inspected the wreckage unhappily. Nobody had been hurt, but the vehicle looked like it had been smashed by a giant hammer. It's good imagery. We don't have any spare sleds, Henry sighed, and that gun is too big to put on another load. We will have to build a new sled, extra strong. So this next paragraph that I'm going to read to you is a paragraph that models the text structure of sequencing. Do you remember one of the first days that we were on remote learning, I had you watch a YouTube video about text structures? This is modeling one of those text structures that we read. The Colonel's plan wasn't as simple as he thought. First, the right hardwood trees need to be located. Then they had to be cut down and sawed into planks and runners. Next, they had to find a local blacksmith to forge iron rims for the runners and bolt them into place. And finally, metal rings had to be attached to hold the harness in. Henry growled over the delay. So he said it was four things that had to happen. So we went in sequence of how they happened. It took full, two full days to build and load the new vehicle. Then at last, he gave the signal and they started on their way. Leaving Claverack and the Hudson Valley behind, the caravan crossed into Massachusetts. Ahead lay the roughest part of the trip, the Berkshire mountain range. Here, the tired men would face 100 miles 
of wild country, steep hills and deep ravines, treacherous gorges and steams, fi streams filled with jagged rocks. For most of the way, there were absolutely no roads or trails, not even crude footpaths. As they pushed onto the Great Barrington, Will Knox studied the looming hills. Foreshadowing, guys. He felt nervous and worried. The caravan was way behind schedule and now they faced their biggest challenge. Some instinct told the young soldier that these high rocky mountains and not the British were going to be their worst enemy. Okay, so let's look at this chapter. We got a lot to unpack here. Guys, we've got some conflict on having to build the new sleds. We've got some setting. Again, this is talking about how it's in sequential order. We've got some purple to mark here. Guys, when you come to the other side, you're going to notice that I have this as both foreshadowing as well as conflict. This entire area here can be marked as suspense and this entire area will be conflict with more foreshadowing at the end. All right, because this is real world and I actually have to do this very quickly, I need to let my dog out to go to the bathroom because he's sitting very patiently at the door. See my dog? Say hi, Barkley. Can you say hello? Okay, okay, mom. All right, let me let the dog out and I'll read the next chapter. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> That's real world. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Back to reading. Let's put you back in position. Okay, so here we go. Uh, our next chapter is called A Walk in the Rain. Now, by looking at this, I know that it's snowing where the, the wagon train's going, or it's at least really cold. So just by looking at that title, I'm going to kind of make an inference that our author is going to jump to a different location. And if we're walking out in the rain. I seriously doubt that General Washington is going for just a little traipse in the rain. That doesn't seem very logical. So I'm going to speculate that we're going to go back to our main character uh, or one of our characters, uh, Paul Revere Jr., uh, which means my setting would probably be back in Boston. So let's see if I'm right. Um, a Walk in the Rain, Chapter 8. Ooh. I actually wrote on the top of this, or is that metaphorical for a, a walk in sorrow, like sadness? Let's see. It was, dri it was drizzling in Boston. Ah, ha, ha, I was right. All right. It was drizzling in Boston, a thin rain, more like a cold mist. The two companions walked down Beacon Street, their jacket collars turned up, their shoulders hunched against the wetness. Nearby on the common, a company of soggy redcoats was going half-heartedly through a drill. The walkers stopped to watch. They are a sorry-looking lot. That means they don't look very professional. Paul Jr. whispered. Old Toby grunted. Remember who old Toby is? He's the boatman who brings information. Okay. Old Toby grunted. Part of Howe's reinforcements. Three troop ships came in yesterday from England with a whole passel of new soldiers. It's like soldiers. Paul frowned. I was afeard of it. I saw the ships anchored off Hudson's Point this morning. Okay, so let me show you that. Guys, this is man versus society. The, the, they're getting their, their supplies a lot faster. And remember, this is a detriment. We wanted the cannons to arrive first, and right now they're not arriving. So that's kind of a sad bit of information. The old boatman spat in the muddy road. There be rumors, he said in a low voice, that England is having trouble with volunteers. Not many British lads are keen on sailing the ocean to fight us on our home ground. I hear tell that Bow Wow Howe, that's General Howe, Bow Wow Howe had to scrape the bottom of the barrel. So that's an idiom, guys. And what that means is he had to go and get soldiers that he would not normally have recruited. Normally he would have gotten better soldiers and he would have passed on these guys and said, no, you're not really dedicated, you're not really trained, I'm gonna get the better guys. But right now, he doesn't have that option anymore. He has to take whatever he can get. Paul studied the Marines, drilling carelessly. Looks to me like they're half starved. So that would be conflict right there. Well, I'll show you this in a minute. Toby nodded. Aye, it's thin rations. But I'll tell you something, lads. Their cannons aren't going hungry. There's plenty of powder to feed them. It's personification. And now it looks like the British have most as many fighting men as General Washington. 
The strollers, one young and vigorous, the other old and hobbling, went past John Hancock's mansion on the slope of Beacon Hill. Hancock, a rebel leader wanted by the British, was safe in Philadelphia. But one of Howe's aides, General Henry Clinton, was using the Hancock home as headquarters, so it had been spared destruction. The drizzle finally ended and the walkers turned into Cornhill Street, where Henry Knox once had his bookshop. All right, so I think I've already shown you this page, but I wanna do it again just in case. And then here's this one, so if you wanted to stop, pause, and mark it up, you can do that. A Couple of things I wanna talk about on this page. We've got a little bit of suspense in green. Um, we have another text structure here, guys. It says cause and effect. Because Hancock wasn't living in his mansion and it was nice, this other guy went in to make it the headquarters. So that's cause and effect. The cause was he left, the effect was someone else came in. So we've got a little bit of conflict, we've got some figurative language, and a new character of General Henry Clinton. They leaned against the moss, oops, I forgot a line, hold on. Um, near the old state house, they leaned up against the mossy wall and the boatman lit his pipe. He looked up and down carefully and then leaned over to his young friend. Look you, Master Paul, Washington has had another dispatch from Colonel Knox. Your friend, Will, and his cannons have gotten as far as Claverack. I'd say that's nigh on halfway, so they're about halfway. Now they must come east over the mountains. I wrote a little marginal note like, how does Toby get all this information? And he really did, guys, it really was a Toby. So this is all true information. Paul was excited at the news. I keep hoping and praying they'll reach Cambridge soon. He sighed, do you think they will make it? The old timer squinted up at the clouded sky. Can't rightly say, but if they don't, Boston's done for. The city was gloomy and half deserted. A few people in drab clothing hurried by, their faces thin and pale. Paul tried to shift to a cheerier note. Toby, Toby, I had mind to ask you, what does the new flag look like? The boatman's f f old face crinkled into a smile. Ah, the grand union flag. Guys, I'm gonna suggest that you go onto Google and type in the grand union flag. This was actually our very first flag. It wasn't, the, everyone thinks the first flag is the one with the 13 stars in a circle, but if you go and look, this was actually the first one, so it's kinda cool. Um, I was right there when General Washington raised her for the first time. Aha, that's how he knows. He's in with General Washington, so he's like hanging out and spending time with good old George, which is how he knows all the information. So right from the horse's mouth. She's got red and white stripes, 13 of them, one for each colony. And in the upper corner, the canton they calls it, there's a small Union Jack for old time's sake. The veteran shook his head with wonder. I tell you, son, it's powerful good to see our own flag flying in the breeze over Cambridge. Paul looked around at the sad gray city. You think, he said wistfully, We'll ever see it flying over Boston? Toby trudged along, chewing moodily on his pipe, and gave no answer. So there's our chapters for today. So let's go ahead and get this marked up. Pause it if you need, and here's this. Now, we can predict that it is going to eventually fly over Boston because of the flag that flies over the United States now. But how is that going to happen? And are these other guys going to be successful? Well, I don't know. We'll have to figure it out. Okay, so guys, make sure you have that marked up. Remember that tomorrow in our Zoom class, we're gonna discuss these two chapters and I will be going over the quiz that you're going to take on Microsoft Teams. So please, 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 make sure you've done your reading. Um, you will be able to use the book on the quiz. So, you know, things that we've marked up, things that I've asked you to look at. So there you go. I miss you. All right, take care, guys. Bye-bye.